I mean, how would you sum up how this week's gone for you? Well, it's obviously been a rough week, but the reality is the Prime Minister is sticking to his guns and what he said to get us out of this rut that we're in. We're going to keep uh, going on with the negotiations with the EU. We want to deal by the end of October, but we must leave come what may. I think the country otherwise will be drawn quicker into the, the quicksand, if you like. That's what Labour's uh, surrender bill that Jeremy Corbyn backed this week would mean. And we've got to get out of that rut. And one of the reasons we want to get out of the rut is to talk about all the positive things we did also have a spending review this week, we didn't mention that, where we talked about extra police on the street, levelling up school funding, uh, grappling with the social care challenge. All the things I think most people, if they voted to leave or remain, now want us to get uh, focused on uh, and not keep talking about Brexit, get that done, keep our promises, but talk about those other things too. I mean, that's what the Prime Minister is doing. The challenge, of course, is now to get Brexit done, of course, uh, because things are perhaps got slightly more complicated, shall we say, where that's... Uh, Concerned. I want to address first the resignation of Amber Rudd, yes, of course. which happened uh, overnight. Um, she had some pretty stinging criticism, didn't she, uh, of the, the party, uh, and didn't just resign from the cabinet, but she also resigned from the Conservative whip. I mean, what does it say about the state of the Conservative Party when people like Amber Rudd just can't stomach it any longer? Well, I'm really sorry to see Amber step down. I like her, I respect her. We became MPs at the same time in 2010. But I think in fairness, when she took the cabinet role, everyone was asked, do you accept and can you sign up to and will you support the Prime Minister's plan to leave by the end of October, preferably with a deal, but if not, come what may. And we all accepted that. And I think um, the Prime Minister was right to restore some discipline. And I think he's right to expect it from his top team. You say that it was right to install some discipline, but is this now a, becoming a party for Brexit purists? I mean, are you effectively now the Brexit party? Well, no, I guess I'd say in relation to, um, first of all, what we've seen this week on the One Nation vision, more police on the street, uh, grappling with uh, school funding, making sure the NHS investment gets to the front line. That shows you we want to actually start talking about all the things, the bread and butter issues, if you like, voters really care about. But there's nothing that's changed since, in fairness and with respect, since Amber took the Cabinet role. She was asked... Well, she thinks that the thing that's changed is that it's no... She doesn't believe that the objective is there to get a deal. Well, I can tell you, having been in all of the subcommittee meetings and uh, having been out to talk to EU foreign ministers last week, uh, and if you look at the change, which is a question people were rightly asking, what's changed in the negotiations? Actually, the EU have gone from saying we can't touch the withdrawal agreement or reopen it to saying they're willing in principle to do so. That was a victory for the Prime Minister at the G7, and we've been following up on that. So actually, there has been uh, progress. But the one thing holding us back is this sense in Brussels that perhaps Parliament, through this uh, surrender bill Jeremy Corbyn has led would actually perhaps delay again or even cancel Brexit. We can't have that. The it other... fundamentally weakens our negotiating position, which is why with respect, I think the rebels this week were wrong. Well, let's talk about the rebels, shall we? Because this is another reason that Amber Rudd said she just could not stand by. We can have a quick look at something she wrote in her uh, resignation letter. I must also address the assault on decency and democracy that took place last week when you sacked 21 talented, loyal One Nation Conservatives. And she goes on to say uh, after that, the short-sighted culling of my colleagues has stripped the party of broad-minded and dedicated Conservative MPs. I cannot support this act of political vandalism. She says she can't stand by. Can you stand by? Oh, of course. Look, the, the reality is, and I regret anyone that's had the uh, whip withdrawal, and I don't, no one wants to see that. But let's be clear about it. This was because they voted for motions and legislation that gave Jeremy Corbyn control... Hold on, it's a bit important for people to understand. Control of the business of the House of Commons and control of the negotiations. They were told in advance it would be a confidence issue. So I regret it, but it was their choice, and they did it knowing what the implications would be. First and foremost for the country, that's the real vandalism to democracy that's going on and second of all in terms of the whip being withdrawn so I regret it and we need to keep the family together but the Prime Minister was very clear and one of the reasons with voters that we've seen an increase in support for the Conservatives is I think he's given a clear sense of direction and now we're going to stick to the plan. At the same time though you kicked out former chancellors, people like Ken Clark, who became an MP when Boris Johnson was five years old, people like Philip Hammond, who until six weeks ago, before he was kicked out, was the chancellor, people like David Gork, yeah. who was the first time he's ever broken the whip. I mean, how many times have you ever broken the Conservative whip? Well, not on an issue of confidence. And I've well, never been more well, times than David Gork. Well, no, but I've never voted to give... You have voted on some Sorry. big issues. Sophie, let me answer the question. I have never voted 
to give Jeremy Corbyn control of the legislative agenda in the House of Commons or control over the Brexit negotiations. These are all decent people. I, I, I like them, I respect them. But it was right that the discipline was restored because they knew what they were doing. And I, and I think the one thing we've got to have... You, you said that they were, you, know, you referred to status. I don't think your status in the party is the key issue. The question is whether you keep to your promises and you understand our promises we all made at the 2017 election are manifesto. And you understand when you go into a vote like that, where it was very clear how serious this was, giving Jeremy Corbyn that control over the House of Commons, over the Brexit negotiations, they did what they did knowingly. And I think Boris Johnson was right, and I say this with regret, in sorry not in anger, to follow through on that. Do you think they should be offered a way back? I think we always want to keep building bridges and to make sure that there are uh, ways to uh, keep the family together. But I think it's very difficult, having not just once, but on a number of occasions now, voted on that those confidence uh, issues uh, with the implications that they've had, making it so much harder for us to get the deal with the EU that everyone in the Conservative Party wants. I think they've made that very difficult. But that was a choice that they made, knowingly, and aware of all the consequences and the implications. Is Dominic Cummings a member of the Conservative Party? I don't know, you'd have to ask uh, him there. Uh, I, I don't know, I've never had the uh, conversation with him. He doesn't do interviews? No, well, you know, advisors advise, ministers decide. But actually the key thing with all of this is that the people, and this is, I think, a big change, that we've got ministerial accountability. We didn't have that in fairness. My experience of Brexit with Ollie Robbins, with the greatest respect to the civil servants, and I think we do have that now. So I think it's right that elected politicians uh, take responsibility like I'm doing on the show with you. Do you think that it's a bit strange you don't know if he's a member or not? No, there's loads of people that I don't ask uh, those sorts of questions uh, of. Not loads of people advising the Prime Minister, perhaps. Well, I don't have that. I can tell you, actually, I've never had that conversation with anyone that advised the Prime Minister. Actually, we've, uh, there's a story uh, about John Mann, who's uh, Labour MP, but helping us with um, some of the stuff, that, the position. This was an appointment under Theresa May originally in relation to anti-Semitism. Well, he's obviously not a Conservative. We want to be a broad church. Actually, the Conservative parties at its best when we're a big tent broad church and we do need to keep the family together and I and I, and I want to see that happen but I do also think that on some of these key issues people need to understand and the voters get it that we've got to keep to the plan and stick to the plan and we can't delegate any of this stuff to Jeremy Corbyn it's too dangerous let's, my let's talk about the plan then uh, because I'm really keen to try and work out what the plan actually is and um, just to we discussed uh, Amber Rudd's resignation a little bit earlier just want to have a look at what she said in her resignation letter mm. when it comes to the deal because she said one of the main reasons for quitting is I no longer believe that leaving with a deal is the government's main objective the government is expending a lot of energy to prepare for no deal but I have not seen the same level of intensity go into our talks with the European Union, who have asked us to present alternative arrangements to the Irish backstop. I mean, lots of people will read that and will be worried. Well, first of all, it's not correct. Um, firstly, because we uh, have had intense negotiations. David Frost, the political uh, uh, appointment, but the, spe the special advisor to the Prime Minister. Steve Barclay's been out. I've been out to Helsinki to speak to EU foreign ministers. I've seen um, a whole range of them to talk about Brexit, but also all the other issues we're working on. But also one point about the no deal planning. Of course, that is crucial to getting a deal because it sends the message to Brussels that we want a deal, we've set that out, but also that we're going to leave at the end of October if they continue to play hardball. So those two things are actually linked. And the big frustration I've got this week is MPs that have tried to take no deal off the table, explain that uh, they want uh, uh, an extension. That sends the EU the wrong message at the wrong time. I mean, the main thing stopping a deal, though, is the fact that you want to get rid of the backstop, but the EU says you have to come up with alternative proposals. Have you actually come up with some different plans? There are a clear whole range of possibilities. We've got the Prime Minister's letter, which sets out the framework for it, and David Frost and Steve Barclay have been working what, through the what detail. Are the de what, are, what, what are the so, plans? Have you actually put forward anything? So we've been engaged in discussions. What we're slightly reticent about doing, given past experience, is putting uh, pieces of paper that will get leaked and rubbished by the other side. But the proposals will be around things like uh, intelligence-led checks away from the border, exemptions for small businesses, trusted trader uh, routes, making sure that we can look at um, uh, maintaining the island of Ireland and not have any infrastructure at the border. All of those conversations have been uh, ongoing. And actually, there's a really credible way to sort this problem out. But it does require political will in Dublin and from the rest of the EU. We'll continue with these negotiations. The Prime Minister is seeing the Irish uh, Taoiseach uh, 
uh, early next week. And we are committed absolutely to getting a deal. But one of the things that's crucial is that no deal isn't taken off the table. First of all, it's the responsible thing to plan for. Um, but secondly, because it gives the EU that crucial message that we're serious about leaving and they need to move too. OK, well, let's try and work out what happens if you can't get a deal. Sure. If we take you at your word, that, that is still your main objective. But what happens if it doesn't happen by the deadline? Do you accept that the legislation passed by Parliament, the law passed by Parliament, compels Boris Johnson to ask for an extension rather than seek a no deal? if you can't get a deal? Well, first of all, the key thing with an extension is it requires uh, agreement on both sides. I think it's very difficult for the legislation to uh, micromanage in detail how that conversation will go. We will adhere to the law, but we'll also, because this is such a bad piece of legislation, the, the surrender bill that Jeremy Corbyn backed, we also want to test to the limit what it does actually lawfully require. So what That's does that the mean then? What does that mean? We will look very mean? carefully at the implications and our interpretation of it to make in sure... In the courts, do you mean? No, I mean... I mean, actually, across the board, we will look very carefully legally at what it requires and what it doesn't require. I think that's not only the lawful thing to do, it's also the responsible thing to do. And again, I'll repeat, that legislation is lousy. It envisages multiple delays. It would effectively try and force us to accept conditions from the EU, however vindictive, punitive or harsh they may be. And as we, if we ended up extending, we, Prime Minister made clear he will not do it, it would cost the UK taxpayer a uh, gross figure, a billion pounds each month. That's just a lousy so piece of legislation. The of Prime Minister going... will not extend in any circumstances, is that what you're saying? He's been very clear about it this week. So in that way, in that he would either ignore the legislation put forward or he we're, would resign? We're always, we're always going to behave lawfully as a government. Of course, you'd expect that. And anyway, it will be challenged in the courts. But what we are going to do with that legislation is test very carefully what it does and doesn't require. And that's not only the lawful thing to do, I think it's the responsible thing to do. The irresponsible thing to do is to support that legislation, which weakens our negotiating position in Brussels. Are you prepared to take it to the courts to test it, if that's what it takes? We can't necessarily control that. The people at various points challenged the government over Brexit. We had two legal challenges. Uh, last week alone, but we won both of those. But these things need to so be looked at so very just, carefully. Just, just, just be, so you're effectively saying that you are prepared to ignore this law that's been passed and, take, and then be challenged on it in the courts, if that's, that's what it takes. As you know, Sophie, that's not what I said. What I said is we're going to look at it very carefully, test what it legally requires and what it doesn't require, and that's the responsible thing to do because it's such a bad piece of legislation, and I think it was deeply irresponsible for Jeremy Corbyn to put his weight behind it. He's trying to drag this country into the quicksand, deeper and deeper, whereas what Boris Johnson is trying to do is get us out of the Brexit rut and get the country moving forward. I mean, some people will look at this and think this is an example of... Boris Johnson effectively thinking that the rules apply to everyone else and he doesn't have to play by the rules. No, I don't think that's true at all. What you're seeing is a Prime Minister that's made a series of very clear promises to get out of the EU, preferably with a deal, to talk about all the other issues like policing, uh, schools, social care, and sticking to his word. I think, if anything, people are a bit surprised that he's sticking to his guns. He's keeping his word. I mean, that's some, what the voters expect. Some are what... saying that he would even go to, could even go to prison if he ignores this legislation. This is ridiculous, I mean. Of course, he's not going to break the law. And of course, um, I think these are all politically motivated uh, comments. But the reality is, you see from some of the polling that we've seen out just uh, today with the Sunday Times and, and elsewhere, that actually the, the voters recognise that we've got a Prime Minister that's trying to get us out of the rut. And you've got Jeremy Corbyn, who's got the handbrake on Brexit and is not allowing the country to move forward. The problem you have, though, is even if it goes down well with the public, you've got to get to the election first and you've been blocked from doing that. And what a terrible look it is for Jeremy Corbyn. Never in history have I ever known a leader of a, an opposition refuse to go to the polls to let the voters decide. It shows he doesn't trust the voters. And it doesn't say a lot about his confidence in his own ability to win that election. And I'm afraid that every Labour MP, again uh, on Monday, when we're going to have another vote on this, is going to have to day by day explain that to their voters, why they're not allowing the country to move forward and they're not allowing us to resolve this with an election. If it doesn't happen on Monday, are you going to try again to bring it back? We're going to keep with the plan, which is to get a deal uh, by the end of October, and if not, to leave uh, on WTO terms. And if we can't get that through, of course we're going to, as a matter of necessity, not because we want it, go to the country to get their backing and the mandate for it. just want to have a quick look at something that Boris Johnson said uh, during the leadership uh, campaign. This is in July of 2019. I think the people of this country are utterly fed up with politicians coming back to them mm. with more elections. It's totally wrong. 
Do you ever wonder why on earth people have such little trust in politicians when they say one thing and then a couple of months later they're doing exactly the opposite? Look, the reality is we don't want an election, but it's been forced on us. It was being forced on us by because we don't have control over the numbers in Parliament. When that happens, everyone... It's not being forced on you. You're trying to make it happen. No, it's been forced on us because we have so limited options because of this uh, surrender bill that Jeremy Corbyn uh, supported and led the, the, the charge on in the House of Commons. What else can we do in, in that scenario? So it's not something we want, but it's, uh, uh, it's become a necessity if we can't continue with the plan. Um, and, and, and actually, the thing that undermines people's trust in politicians is when they don't keep their promises. What Boris Johnson wants to do is keep his promises to get Brexit delivered, but also then to move on and talk about all the other things that we want to do uh, with broadband, with uh, levelling up schools, uh, funding, dealing with gripping social issues like social care. So I think he's sticking to his guns and that's the right thing to do and I think the voters appreciate that. Talking about sticking to your guns, I remember interviewing you during the um, election campaign and you said that the Conservative Party would be toast if you don't leave by the end of October. If we don't leave by the end of October, will you resign? On that basis. <laughs> I don't think I ever said I was going to resign. What I'm going to do is uh, redouble our efforts to get a deal, but in any event, to leave by the end of October. I think that's the right thing to do. Of course, if we can't do that, and it's very clear that the blockage is Jeremy Corbyn, the Liberal Democrats and others who are not willing to respect uh, the referendum. And in the Liberal Democrats' case, they say if there's a second referendum and people voted to leave, they wouldn't respect that either. And I think people will say this, this comes down to politicians keeping their promises and it's about trust in our democracy. I'm doing everything I can to make sure I keep my promises and the government of the day under Boris Johnson delivers. Could you still be part of the government that extends this? Uh, we've, he, Prime Minister has been absolutely clear on this. We're not extending. Um, and I think it's very dangerous. The reality is, what are the problems that we've got? What are the challenges that, that we've got that will get easier if we extend it again? We just have more dither, more delay, which is why the, the PM's absolutely right to say he won't countenance it. OK. And just finally, um, my colleague Sam Coates discovered this week that the Prime Minister called David Cameron a girly swat. And he was overheard, uh, Boris Johnson, in Prime Minister's questions, also calling Jeremy Corbyn a big girl's blouse. I mean, is the word girl an insult? Certainly not. Um, you know, I don't know about any of those comments. I didn't pick them up. But uh, I think the point he's making about Jeremy Corbyn is he's been calling for an election uh, for months, if not years, and now he doesn't want to see it through. And I think most people will see that for what it is. So a girly swat's a compliment, then? Uh, you can call me a girly swat any time. <laughs> 